Good evening, this is Laws 11057, Introduction to Law. It's week four, and this is term three, 2015. Tonight we're talking about a number of issues, uh, following on from previous discussions. And as always, if you wish to ask a question or make a comment, please feel free to interrupt and um, ask the question. So if it's interactive, that's always good. Um, can I just say thank you very much to Luke for providing through you, crew an excellent um, case note example, and uh, that's definitely one that I would commend that you consider. So you'll find that link in you, crew. If you have any problems, please let us know and um, ask the question. So thanks, Luke. Delegated legislation is an interesting topic. It um, takes a little while to wrap your head around it from time to time, but essentially the concept is easy. This is where Parliament delegates the ability to make legislative type rules and regulations to the executive. So it's an example of where the, the lines between the separation of powers is blurred. So commonly, the delegation is given to, for example, a local authority, council, um, or some other executive body. And these um, pieces of delegated legislation make their way into rules um, uh, or law through rules or, or ordinances or bylaws, things of that nature. And why is it done? Well, essentially to save time in Parliament, uh, to cater for changed circumstances, maybe even unforeseen circumstances. But there's another dynamic as well. Lawmaking now is considerably harder than it was in many years ago, um, I suppose because we've got much greater population, population pressures, we've got new areas of law coming in, environmental law, ADR, um, e-technology, and all of this requires greater expertise. And um, one of the advantages that um, Parliament has through delegating its legislation is the ability to call upon that extra expertise at the executive level by delegating the power to make bylaws or regulations or rules to the executive in that regard. And um, sometimes it provides Parliament with an opportunity to get something done quicker, um, more effectively, more flexibly by delegating that power. But bear in mind, of course, that um, any power that is delegated is only as good as the power that was to be delegated. In other words, if the Commonwealth or the states or um, lack the power to make the law in the first place under the Constitution, uh, then they cannot delegate that power and any delegate purporting to make the power also um, lacks the power to make the rule or regulation or bylaw. So if there are any questions in relation to delegated legislation, please let me know because it's an area that um, actually intrigues me a bit how the whole machination of it works. And if, if there are any students in the class that work in the executive and are involved in that hands-on process of making delegated legislation, rules or bylaws, please let us know, perhaps through you, crew, or even tonight if you wish, because I think it's a very interesting discussion point. Now, of course, within the context of our separation of powers, um, say in the judiciary, we have different courts and different tribunals. So that's pretty obvious, but in Queensland, we basically have the four levels. Um, we have the Supreme Court, the District Court, the Magistrates Court, and QCAT. But when I say the levels, it's not necessarily as linear as it might appear. Um, for example, the District Court has certain powers to make um, orders that are equitable in nature. The Magistrates Court doesn't. QCAT does, Supreme Court does. In other areas, for example, to do with guardianship and administration, um, the Supreme Court and QCAT share the powers to make laws in relation to those areas. So, for example, um, as a QCAT member, I have the power to make certain equitable um, rulings, declarations, um, power to um, effectively um, cancel, uh, for want of a better term, powers of attorney. So that's a power that's shared with the Supreme Court. So it, it's not necessarily a linear thing where every court has the same power to undertake decision making as others. Um, also, in terms of the dollar figures, that's a little bit blurred as well. Essentially, working down the Supreme Court is unlimited, 
The district court has power to make decisions in relation to disputes up to $750,000. The magistrate's court has power to make decisions for disputes up to $150,000. And QCAT has two jurisdictions. It has its minor civil disputes um, jurisdiction, where the maximum is $25,000, but it has its other jurisdiction, um, and that is unlimited. So, for example, if there is a residential, as a, a dispute about, as a, about a residential um, building contract, which is heard in QCAT, um, or a residential lease that's in QCAT, then the power of the, um, uh, the tribunal is to make orders that are unlimited in terms of the amount. So the point there is that it's not necessarily straightforward as it seems. Um, and tonight I'm really talking about blurring the lines. So I started from the context of separation of powers and how there is a blur between the legislative and the executive through the process of delegated legislation. And now I'm talking about the blurring that occurs even within the context of the judiciary and that, uh, that range of the law. Now, if you have any questions, please feel free to stop me and ask um, or use the chat facility. Okay. Um, now, there are different types of court processes as well. Typically, where we are familiar with what we would call the adversarial approach, and that is where two lawyers get up and essentially argue against each other on behalf of their client and a decision is made by a judge who remains essentially dispassionate to the process um, and rarely gets involved, but can get involved to a degree by asking some questions, but doesn't get involved to a considerable extent. So that's the adversarial approach. Um, the alternative, which is used commonly in the civil law countries, is the inquisitorial approach, and that's the sort of approach that many tribunals use as well. So in QCAT, we will often use an inquisitorial approach. But it's not just tribunals, courts as well are, um, have different rules depending on the nature of the dispute. So in the district court jurisdiction, the um, planning and environment court, which is, if you like, um, an area or um, of, that, uh, of that particular court, um, is able to inform itself in a way that is fair, quick, accessible, and um, different rules apply when we're dealing with the planning and environment court in the district court area, as opposed to other district court matters. So again, we have a blurring of the lines when it comes to the type of court process. Primarily adversarial, but on occasion inquisitorial, where the tribunal member of the court has the power to roll the sleeves up and get into the problem and uh, inquire about it. Now, just a few topics, a few comments about how to conduct yourself in court um, and outside of court. I would urge you to have a look at the um, material, uh, the, the um, Zoom video by now Judge Dean Morzone, QC. He was um, not appointed at the time that we um, had that um, session, but it's a really excellent session and it's a great insight into his honours um, personality and approach. Um, the reason I, I've mentioned that a few times now is that it really is important that you start to feel that you are part of the profession and part of the profession involves you understanding some of the ground rules so that you can feel comfortable thinking, okay, I know generally how this is done. I haven't done it before, but I know kind of the ground rules. I know what to call people. I know some of the basic etiquette, when to stand, when not to stand things of that nature. And, um, you know, courts, magistrates, judges, they do watch people, and I think you'd be surprised the amount that they see from the bench and the amount they hear from the bench as well. And that's something that Judge Morzone stresses, that you must be very aware of what you are doing, what you are saying, and how you're conducting yourself when you're in court. because. From the elevated position on the bench, the, the judge can actually see an awful lot and hear an awful lot. So keep that in mind um, and try to learn some of the protocols, some of the do's, some of the don'ts. Um, so for example, in court, 
we refer to a magistrate or a judge as, well, I'll ask you, does anyone know what you, in a court context, how would you refer to the presiding officer? You can use the chat facility or you can unmute, whatever you prefer. How do you refer to a court, Your Honour? Your Honour, question mark, yes. That's correct, Your Honour is correct. Um, previously, in the Magistrates Court, it was Your Worship, but that was consolidated, oh gosh, I don't know, 10 years ago. Um, so now it's consistently Your Honour. In a tribunal setting, in say QCAT, it's member, um, is, the, is the usual address form. Now what about socially, what if you, happen to meet a judge in a social context, how would you refer to the judge in that context? Does anyone wish to offer an opinion? What would be the appropriate address? And the reason I'm saying this is I want you to feel like you're part of the profession, part of the crowd, as it were. You can use the chat facility or you can unmute. How do you address a judge in a social context? Justice, X, Y, Z, yes, that, that would be acceptable. It's very formal, um, but uh, you can't make a mistake doing that. But bear in mind, of course, that when we talk about justice, we are talking about a Supreme Court judge as opposed to judge, which is the address um, in the district court. So it might be Justice Applegarth as opposed to Judge Morzone, Supreme and District. Any other ways to address a judge in a social setting? Would you address them as sir? Yes. Sorry, sir or madam, you can't go too far wrong with that. But that's not typically what we do. Sometimes people say, continue with the your honour. And that's fine. In a social context, you can still say your honour. But typically, I would suggest judge. So, um, for example, if you, if you run into a judge, you know, at a, at a dinner, at a, at a restaurant or something, there's really nothing at all wrong with saying, good evening, judge. And um, uh, if you do that, the judge is likely to earmark you as being part of the profession. Okay, um, how would you address the Attorney General as a member of the profession? The usual protocol is attorney, gear attorney, or uh, good afternoon attorney. Um, so not necessarily the full attorney general, but there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, are there any questions then about that? And you understand why I'm saying that? Because I want you to be more involved and feel part of it. If you're dealing with a magistrate, uh, socially, it would normally be Mr. or Mrs. or Ms. Um, same with a QCAP member in that sense. Okay, let's talk about a little bit more substance. Um, I'd like to run through some criminal trial procedures. And this is a real basic introduction to it. But you may have seen from past exams, I do toss in something which tests your ability to deal with an issue as if you were a first year lawyer. And there might be something in the exam about criminal trial procedure. I'm not saying there is, but there might be. So for example, if you are a first year lawyer and on your first day you get a call comes through it's one of the very good clients of the firm who was at the police station um, or the police have arrived at his or her workplace and um, they wish to speak with him or her in relation to alleged criminality using the chat facility or coming in live can you tell me some of the things that you might be uh, you might want to advise your client at that early critical stage. Let's say the police have arrived at his workplace, make it a he, and he's phoned you to say the police are here, what do I do? What are some of the basic rules? Don't say anything until the solicitor or lawyer arrives. Okay, that's excellent, yes. And William goes further and says, just don't say anything. And I think that's probably right too. So both those answers are acceptable. However, if you do get to, to the client's venue, uh, at that stage you would probably say, don't say anything anyway. 
So there's nothing wrong with saying that over the telephone. Now, it's not, a, it's not an absolute rule, but I think it's probably fair to say in 99 out of 100 cases where I'm in a situation of giving that advice, I would um, say to the client, don't, you have a right to silence, and I think you should exercise that right. So my advice to you, unless there's a very good reason not to, is to remain silent. Okay. Um, if the police have arrived in the premises, is there anything else that you'd want to know about the basis upon which the police are there? Police arrived, are they allowed to just walk in? Any comments, any thoughts? Do they have a warrant? Do they have a warrant? Yep, that's exactly what I was looking for. And I, there's nothing wrong with asking that question from the outset to determine whether the police are there uh, to make inquiries, in which case, if they don't have a warrant, the client's perfectly entitled to say, um, don't, I don't wish to speak to you and I'm not inviting you to stay on the premises, in which case that forces the hand and the police will have to leave. But if someone is in harm, they don't need one. If there are certainly exceptions to it. If there is harm, they won't necessarily need a warrant. If there is, um, essentially, if they have uh, detected that a crime has been committed at the time, they won't need a warrant. In some circumstances, they will need to go back to the magistrate after the event and seek a post-search uh, warrant um, to validate their actions. And that might be something that you attack down the track. So just in general terms, um, the right to silence, and in general terms, unless your client has consented to the police being on the premises, the police require a warrant. Okay, um, let's say you get a call and your client is in the watch house, uh, he's been taken in, we'll use a he again, and um, what procedure would you adopt in those circumstances? Well, I'll give you an idea of what I do, and that is, um, typically I'll get the call from the investigating or arresting officer. And they'll say, I'm in the watch house, I have your client, let's call him uh, John Smith. Uh, I have John Smith in custody um, at the moment and uh, he wants to speak with you. Before I speak to the client, I would say to the officer, let's call him um, you know, Jim Brown, Officer Brown, um, I just want to ask you a few questions first. Uh, the first is, have you arrested my client? And typically the answer is no, the client's not under arrest at this stage. Um, has my client made any statement to you at this stage? And typically they'll say no. Oh, he did mention something in the, um, in the car, but we're not going to use that as part of our evidence. All right, so he hasn't made any statement that's admissible at this stage. Yep, yeah, all right. Um, have you, are you, is there a particular thing that you're investigating? Yes, we're investigating a burglary that's alleged to have occurred last night. All right, do you have any um, corroborating evidence at this stage? Yeah, we've got some CCTV footage and we've got a statement from the neighbour. All right, so my client hasn't said anything, but you have got some evidence. Do you intend to charge my client irrespective of whether he makes a statement or not? Uh, well, we haven't decided yet, but yeah, probably we will. All right. Well, if he does, if you do charge the client, do you expect that there'll be an objection to bail? And at that stage, they might say, well, we haven't quite decided, but yeah, probably we will object to bail because he's um, already on remand for some other things and hasn't been dealt with. Okay, um, well, let me speak to the client and um, then I'll invite the client to come back to you off the ground. All right, Mr. Smith, um, I'm told that uh, the police are uh, investigating a potential burglary. I'm told that you haven't said anything. Um, I would urge you not to say anything unless there's some good reason to do so. And um, it's likely that you will be charged whether you say anything or not. The police can hold you in the watch house for up to four hours for questioning. That can be extended or they can leave you in the watch house overnight um, pending a bail application tomorrow. So can you handle just not start saying anything and being patient and waiting in the watch house? Yep, I can do that. So at that stage, you might talk about the court where the matter is dealt with. You might say something about bail, this is to your client, and that is that um, the court wants, will want to know where you can live, are you working, do you have family members locally, um, have you breached bail in the past, 
um, do you have um, you know, uh, any reason to approach or uh, interfere with witnesses? All those sorts of things. You might approach that briefly at that early stage. But typically clients are very stressed and uh, they find it difficult to focus in those particular circumstances. So don't be surprised if you can't get a lot of detail done, particularly if the client's not far from the police officer. So at that early stage, you'd be really encouraging your client to keep it, keep it calm, obey the requirements of the officer. Having said that, don't, don't make any statement. Be aware that anything you say will be taken down by the officer. So um, don't fall in the trap of uh, having a casual conversation that might lead you into making some sort of admission. I would then go back to the officer and say, look, I've spoken to my client. I've given him the standard advice not to say anything. He's accepted my advice. I anticipate that uh, I expect from what you've said that he will be charged. If there is a contested bail matter, would you please let me know and I'll meet him at the court tomorrow. Okay, so that's a really quick overview. Um, are there any questions from what I've said? I mean, have I missed anything out? Are there things that trouble you or surprise you from what I've said? Okay, so all pretty straightforward. Okay, um, thank you. All right, so that's what you might need to do if you're in um, that situation. So as I've said to you, I, I like the idea of working back. So now that you know that, if you're planning on working in a law firm, uh, and the answer is I wouldn't necessarily go to the watch house. No, usually I don't. Sometimes I do. Um, but most times I wouldn't necessarily go to the watch house. I mean, I think it's good practice if you do, but there are those sort of time and logistical uh, constraints as well. So what I would urge you to do is now uh, make some notes to yourself so that you can have them ready for the first week that you're in a law firm because who knows, maybe that will happen to you and it would be good if you had your notes prepared and you had your little script ready to go. And who knows, it might even help for the examination as well. All right, um, just in criminal procedure, the um, charge needs to be considered from the perspective of where the matter is dealt with. Not every matter is dealt with in the Supreme Court. Some matters are dealt with in the Supreme Court, some are in the District Court, some are in the Magistrates Court. And if they are in the Supreme or District Court, typically they will go through the Magistrates Court in a committal process before they get to the higher court. So one of the basic things that you need to do is work out where the matter will be dealt with. Now, I have already written that um, Peter Shields gave me this one, uh, and he's given me authority to provide that to you. Have I put that on the, the website yet? The Ready Reckoner by Peter? Peter was involved in that baby play matter too. All right, um, to, if you could just remind me, I'm away from my desk at the moment, but if you can remind me if you want that Ready Reckoner, please let me know. And that's really handy because it um, will identify pretty quickly which court the matter must be dealt with um, and, uh, and the basis for, for doing that. All right, um, and also, of course, there are different rules that apply whether the uh, alleged offence is Commonwealth or State. Now, that's a really quick overview. There's a lot more to it, but many of you will be doing or have done the criminal law. So I won't need to go any further than that. But if you have any questions, please feel free to ask now or come in through you proof. Now, civil, civil trial procedure is entirely different, of course, in that in a civil trial, the very first thing that we remember is the onus of proof, the burden of proof is quite different. In a criminal law trial, the prosecutor needs to establish the evidence beyond reasonable doubt. I think we all know that. In a civil jurisdiction, it's on the balance of probabilities. What is more likely? So bear that in mind when you're considering the difference between the two. And in a civil situation, the proceedings are commenced in different ways, using different forms. It might be a claim, a statement of claim, or a summons, it might be an application. Um, so there are different, different ways to initiate the process. And then, of course, you need to serve your process after it's been filed on the other side. What you should do at that stage is carefully diarise 
the date by which the respondent, the defendant, is required to file a defence. Because if the defendant doesn't file a defence within time, it gives you an opportunity to lodge an application for judgment by default, uh, which is where they haven't, they haven't filed a defence, so therefore I want my judgment in default or by default. Um, in civil law proceedings, there are pre-trial disclosures that need to be considered, and always you need to think about the ADR process generally, alternative dispute resolution process generally, or it might be a specific matter relevant to that court. So for example, in a planning and environment law situation, there are specific ADR rules that are applicable to that type of um, uh, jurisdictional dispute. Um, how many cases generally go to ADR? In the civil sense, many do. It's very popular now. And um, it's something worth considering from the outset, even before you file material. But ADR is really a very common process now. Um, it's used extensively in courts and tribunals. And um, courts will even encourage parties to do that, even if it's not strictly part of the uh, uh, initial process. Okay, all right, so thank you very much. You're all hanging in there very well tonight. Um, just a few comments about legal research. Um, I hope that you've all started your third assessment piece. I hope you've started to play around with the different platforms, get an idea of what you uh, want to do. And have a look at chapter six of the new lawyer. It's a really good introduction to legal research and goes into discussing some of the basic skills that you need. And really, it's a you know, systematic type approach. And know where to look. You'll, you'll develop your favourites. Um, we all have different favourites on where to go. And um, I think I did give you an exercise of trying to find the Australian Consumer Law and the Criminal Code. Have I given you that yet? I must do that. No, all right. I'll need another reminder for that one as well. Um, and have a look at good quality information, which is available readily now, LexisNexis, Thomson Reuters, CCH, um, and the free facilities, Barnett, Jade, uh, Ostley, um, Conmore, they're all really good, um, they're all really good sites. It's so much easier now than it was when I started in the, um, in the 80s. Well, it's so plan your research, identify initially what task you're dealing with. So are you drafting a contract? Are you drafting a deed? Are you drafting an opinion? Or are you preparing some pleadings for court uh, case? So you need to know what it is that you're trying to achieve at the end. And then try to identify the area of law that you're practicing in. Now that might seem a bit silly. You might think, oh, well, it's obvious it's contract law. Um, but you might have a contract issue which involves some areas of torts or consumer law or even constitutional law. Um, so just be aware that you may need to draw on your skills that you pick up in different areas of law and it's not necessarily going to be a case of one area of law pigeonholed as being the one that's relevant to your case. Um, when you're doing your research, be prepared to brainstorm. Uh, we'll talk more about brainstorming in a different sense later in the court. But by brainstorming, I mean just let yourself Think about some different ways of considering the research skill um, from the outset. And it may be that you come up with something that's a bit unusual, but highly effective. Now, as a practicing lawyer, you need to balance a few things with your research. I've seen lawyers that are very quick and very effective with their research and they get straight to it and the job is done. I've seen other lawyers who labour over their research to the extent that they're still in the office at 11 p.m., uh, get into the office at 6 a.m. the next day, and after a week have mountains and mountains of material. But if you say to them, all right, pretend that you are in front of the judge now and tell me your prime arguments, they can't do it. They're just lost in a mountain of material. Now, you'll find that in practice with some people you also find that in your studies. So you need to work out some ways of dealing with that. Again, 
let's do the let's think backwards approach. So in the context of your study, trying to do your research, you need to pass the exam. You need to have your work ready by a certain date. You need to think about the other things in your life, and the other commitments to study, and try to work out realistically what is the limit of time that you can spend on this particular task, and then work towards that. But if you don't plan things out, you'll end up like some of those junior, law uh, those junior lawyers who after a week have a mountain of material, they haven't done anything else, so they're way, way behind. Now they've got clients screaming at them on the other jobs, and they can't present any form of succinct argument. And that's partly because they started the research process without a proper planning mind. They didn't start from the back and work at the end and work backwards. So you've really got to do that with your research and think about your time frames. Think about the cost implications for you personally, for your firm, for your boss, and also for the client. You know, you can't send a bill in to the client saying, I spent 100 hours on researching your matter, but I can't have it really come up with any proper argument. It's just not going to go over well from a commercial point of view. And, and your partners won't be happy as well. So think about that and learn some of the tricks. Think to yourself, what is the most efficient way for me to get this job done? And that'll be different, unfortunately, for everybody. Um, but there are some things that you can consider. Boolean connectors are good, so you know, director's duties and duty of care. So that's the Boolean collector where you capitalise the word and in the middle, and you can use it in different ways as well, or not, things of that nature. So have a look at those Boolean connectors when you're doing your legal research. Um, think about the primary source versus the secondary source. I think I've mentioned a few times now that I favour the primary sources. I normally go to the legislation and then do the case law and then maybe to the secondary materials like textbooks. Others may have a different approach altogether and say, no, why do all that primary research when somebody's already done it? Go straight to the textbook. Different people will have different techniques, things that work for them, and that's all part of what you can tell me in your legal research as well. Um, so bear that in mind as it's something that um, you need to discover for yourself. And find out what are the key areas of legislation. Um, so if you're dealing with, say, criminal law, well, you're going to have to know the Criminal Code, the Drugs Misuse Act, the Police Powers and Responsibilities Act, and just key pieces of legislation, kind of the go-to places. And the uh, same if you're dealing with family law, well, obviously the Family Law Act, things of that nature. So understand where the key pieces of um, material are. Um, and also develop a technique so you work through a system in a certain way. And what I often do is, if I'm really a bit stuck and it's, it's very broad, I'll do a scanning process first and then a perusal later. Scanning is essentially speed reading. Perusal is a secondary or detailed reading. And uh, that's what you need to consider in that context. Um, when you do get to the detail, just be really careful to slow right down because an it or not or an or or an and or something like that can actually make a big difference. And um, watch out for special words like unless. You know, if you miss the unless, you can go off on a wrong tangent completely. Uh, so just watch out for those special words. All right. Um, Hopefully you've all been working your way through the Australian Guide to Legal Citation. Um, hopefully you're getting the hang of footnotes as, as opposed to endnotes or referencing on the body of the text. Um, hopefully you, you're seeing when you need to type things in italics, such as legislation or case law, and uh, all of that should be apparent in the first assignment. As I'm sure many of you have already um, uploaded, if you haven't, uh, it's tomorrow night, isn't it? It's June, it's that one. Um, so, good luck with all that. Um, do you really need a reference list? Uh, you don't need a reference list, no, but you do need to be able to reference appropriately. 
and uh, just look out for some tricks. I think I've mentioned before, just learn from osmosis. Just have a look at the way in which the authors of the textbook and the judges in cases reference their material. Just follow from that lead and you can't go too far wrong. Okay. Um, a cover letter, uh, a page, cover page. Yeah, um, you don't have to have a cover page. I personally think it's not a bad idea to have a cover page. It looks very professional, but you don't have to. Um, but uh, appearances count for a bit in law. You need to present your material in a professional manner. And uh, if you're if you're thinking of um, presenting something in the, in a fashion that will draw attention to the material, then maybe a cover page you think uh, is a worthwhile idea. All right, um, what I'll do is invite you to read chapter seven, interpretation skills for yourself. We might um, deal with some of those a bit next week. And of course, I'm looking forward to uh, dealing with all of your assessment work um, as I see it during the uh, assessments that are due tomorrow. So we might wrap up at this stage, but are there any questions before we do? I'm just making a note to myself as to where I want to next time. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry it's been probably a bit hard to see me on this small screen. Um, how long before you get your grades back? Uh, what I do is typically all my assignments are due on the Thursday evening at midnight and I then um, wait for late submissions up until the Sunday, Saturday of the following week. So Saturday week will be the cutoff. You can't submit after that. And with any luck, you'll get your results on the Sunday of next week, Sunday week, or the Monday. That's my aim. I should mention there are a few different ways that I use to uh, provide feedback. And uh, it's all a bit arbitrary, depends on, on how I feel. Sometimes it's in writing. But what I might do is um, provide you with some generalised comments for the class and then provide you with some audio commentary in relation to your specific assignment so you can access that um, audio individually. Typically, I don't release all of the marks, so you won't see what others have got, uh, have, have achieved for the results, um, unless you ask that person. I don't normally publish individual results for individual people, but I might give an overall average, for example, I might do that. Okay, are there any questions about that first assessment piece, the lodgement? Um, yeah, the flashcards. I, with the um, flashcards, that's something that's been um, agitated primarily by Professor Colburn. Um, he's working on it with Wayne Jones and I. I sent an email through saying we have a problem, but I haven't followed through with that. So I take it the flashcards aren't working at this stage. Is that the case? Thanks for thanks for your patience. You're the you're the first group through. I think I mentioned that for you, but I'll follow that up with um, Professor Colgrave. Uh, so no progress at this stage. Sorry, Emma. All right. If there, unless there's any questions, we might call it a night at that. And I thank you very much for your patience. I'll stop recording now. All the best. Bye.